start then. Um, hello, everyone watching, and welcome to September's River Volta. My name is Amanda Dawson. I'm one of the organizers for the River Volta, and I will be your host for this evening. Uh, tonight, we have two very talented writers, Sarah Enns and Francine Cunningham. I'm trying not to gesture at them on my screen, but <laughs> you can see them. Um, so following our readings, just keep in mind, we're going to have a period of time for a short Q&A. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask our readers, please use the Q&A channel at the bottom of the screen, not the chat, because it might get lost in the chat. Um, I would also like to point out the whole speaker thing. View uh, tonight's proceedings in speaker format, not the gallery format, and then you'll be able to see whoever is talking at the moment. Um, so moving right along. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge our presence on Treaty 6 territory, the original territory of the Nahiowak, Anishinaabe, Nakoda, and Diné people, and on the homeland of the Métis Métis Nation, sorry, <laughs> tongue-tied. All right, um, well, with that, let's introduce our first reader. Sarah Enns is a writer and editor based in Treaty 1 territory, Winnipeg, Manitoba. Her poetry has appeared in Prairie Fire, Arc Poetry Magazine, Contemporary Verse 2, Room Magazine, and Sad Mag. And in 2019, she won the New Quarterly's Edna Stabler Personal Essay Contest. She also placed second in CV2's 2019 two-day poem contest and won first place in Room Magazine's 2018 short forms contest. Uh, her debut collection of poems, The World is Mostly Sky, launched in spring 2020. She will graduate with her MFA in writing from the University of Saskatchewan this November. So welcome, Sarah Enns. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I don't know, I feel like waving, but it's, it's very exciting. Thank you so much for asking me to read here. Um, I was feeling all kinds of emotional <laughs> swells um, just because I miss, you know, having a revolta in person and getting to see everyone. And so that's where I am in my heart um, at the moment. So yeah, so thank you to Amanda and Aaron and Tia and Ian for putting this all together and making sure that um, River, River Volta can go on. Um, so I'm going to read mostly from my book, The World is Mostly Sky, but I'm going to start with um, two pandemic poems because those seem uh, like the thing <laughs> to be writing at the moment. Um, this first poem is called This New Spring, April 2020, and um, it's going to be published in a anthology of pandemic writing, which is being compiled by George Melnick. Um, and Taya is also in this anthology. So, um, so yeah, this is called This New Spring. In this new spring, my grandmother learns FaceTime, pours milky eyes into the care home's shared screen. An aide holds it to her like some kind of proof. My grandmother this past winter whispered into clasped hands. I was never homesick when I was with Abe. Abe, my grandfather, who, when he passed, unmoored her, and we had to pin the funeral program above her sink so she'd remember. His strong body resisted death. For months, he wrenched restraints at his wrists. This new spring, the sun is always waning, the wind is a weapon, and the river flocks with shorebirds jolting silver to sky. Just wait, pause for the cat. <laughs> for so many springs, my grandmother's hands would swirl soapy water or, webbed with dough, shape rows of tzvibak to softly rise. At the table beside my grandfather, she'd interlock her fingers with his in prayer. In this new spring, children spread quilts on their separate front lawns, purple yellow squares swathing muted grass, and they stay safe, read aloud across the street, stand sometimes for volume. Sidewalk chalk reminds us to take care of each other, and the elms shake their fists, still alive. I turn my phone to show my grandmother the chalk, the children, muddy snow receding to curves and branches bending gnarled fingers to concrete. She doesn't ask why I don't visit. Instead, have the trees started yet to green? This yearly miracle safe in her memory, renewing her faith 
in each new spring. The second pandemic poem um, I wrote as part of um, Earth World Collaborative, which is a cool group that's mostly based in Montreal, but sometimes they invite uh, prairie people and other people to um, also take part in it. It has musicians and artists and philosophers and poets. Um, and uh, so they're putting together a virtual concert right now called Music from Silence that should be out soon. And they asked me to write a pandemic poem for it. So I wrote this poem, which is called What Sounds Are Left. For two days straight, the man who lives above me sang to Sigur Ross full volume. I lay in my bed looking up, thought the wailing felt so good, like even the air was brokenhearted. Sometimes I hear him sneeze, whir his microwave to life and stamp his floor, my ceiling. Before the waves of Icelandic ambiance came to define our lives, I'd bridged the silence playing Bach for my cat to calm her. Didn't make any difference. She'd skitter walls, leap countertops, and finally settle, not the arias, but some inner force yielding her to stillness, to knowing, her tail a comma on carpet. Now that the Sigur Ross has stopped, I try to take lodging in what sounds are left, the ones that rise like foam, swathing riverbank, tangling reeds, a vacuum down the hall, fizz of fridge, cat crooning. Through the window, goose, magpie, sparrow, pigeon, chickadee especially, their hopes in two notes bobbing. Sometimes, I'm afraid I've placed too much meaning in names, afraid I'll break the quiet wrong. COVID rearranged spells see void, like see the void, like look now at the hole at the center of us. A friend texts, how many days since you've been outside? So I leave my apartment and flinch along the river, startled by cyclists, by my desire to touch, even hold someone's face very close to mine. Sometimes I'm afraid to be alone in the silence because what will I hear? Back home, there is nothing, words unfleshed, the thick hush harbored in me. And Carson says, there is a place inside a word where it falls silent in its own presence. Pandemic, I say, listening. Above me, the man drops something heavy and swears, his shout shattering. Silence, once broken, opens wide, tears from my own throat. So those are my um, two <laughs> angsty <laughs> pandemic poems. Um, so now we're gonna go to the book. Um, and one of the themes in The World is Mostly Sky um, is sort of anxiety, stress, grief um, about the um, environmental catastrophe and the, the climate collapse. So um, I'm gonna read two poems that are about those sorts of um, apocalyptic feelings that also are related to um, my <laughs> growing up um, slash trying to make sense of uh, God. <laughs> so <laughs> apocalypse plus God poems. Uh, the first one is always trees with the almighty. In the woods behind our house was a tree that looked like God pressed a cigarette clean through its trunk. Struck by lightning, we were told, but act of God is what we knew, squeezed into the maple's split center, mouth, meaning portal, password, peak. Each Eden rooted out of reach, we tore mittens thundering up icy bark, snapped branches and bones, named everything we could scale, see, so easily set ablaze. Um, and the next poem is called Age Apocalypse. When I was 16, this boy wanted me to climb a silo on his farm, swing up metal rungs so we could see our whole town down there below. But I never did and never climbed the feed mill either. These my prairie strongholds, these skylines I thought would stay. I climbed instead the bell tower of that church in Piney 
my friends and I scrambling the decaying steps stretched to steeple so we could see the fire we'd followed, its hum of smoke haunting some farmer's field or old forest, I don't know. And it was too far to touch us anyway, this slow moving splinter, its brief opening, and us laughing the way you do when it's always been the end of the world. Um, another major theme of the book is heartbreak slash sadness. <laughs> so I'm going to read a few um, of those. Uh, this one is called Cats, Definitely. This would have been a good time for Balto to make her little cameo appearance, but <laughs> she does what she wants. So <laughs> um, Cats, Definitely. In the glow of my touch screen, he sends results from the allergy test, bumps up and down his forearm. Horses, grass, cats, definitely. I text, sailors at sea kept cats to ward away evil, ensure a safe return. And one night in spring, he coaxes me onto the handlebars of his bicycle, where I taste salt, pollen, see myself for a second as the figurehead weeping. I'm certain he'll spill me into the street, but he laughs because nothing that bad has ever happened to you. And when he leaves, he lint rolls his shirt sleeves, collects the party balloons I blew, abandons the welcome home banner. I wish him nausea when cycling and my bike breaks the next week. I find balloon shards under the couch where my cat hid them. Our remains colorful if deflated. My cat takes care of me, knocks the top of her head into my wrists while I'm reading, bites my naked feet to swell the skin. And I like this idea of welts, spells, of somehow saving my starboard side. Um, the next poem I'm going to read, I have to find it, is called Found Offering. And this one has a <laughs> German word in it, which I'm always nervous about saying wrong, so I probably will again. <laughs> um, it's a hard German word in my defense. <laughs> so the poem is called Found Offering. My arms where they fall rise with rash, angry against the pillow. To be true, this has been my body's reaction to everything unless I can leave it. A trick I do know, fainting in church again this spring. My mom touched two cold fingers to my lips. Remember Berlin? I thought a lot about growing those days, the tenderness that goes into making a person, lying down in St. Johannes Evangelist Kirche, listening to a sound installation. My artist friend afterwards said the bad things she's done left her with boring words. I loved her like that, licking the foam from the edge of her cup, claiming ghosts. And I'm not so scared of haunting now. It seems a comfort. My throat squeezed sore around this morning. So I call angels outreaching, their long fingers scorched against my temple. Last night, I woke just after three, thinking a man was standing above me, shining a flashlight. I couldn't move, kept saying, I don't understand. I try again, say it aloud to the dark stain high on my white wall, some trace of an old tenant. I say it in Latin, low German, my body a house to fail, pray in. I met a beautiful Belgian boy in Berlin. He had strawberry blonde hair and dimples, said cacophony, won a beer tasting competition. And later on the steps to that altar, I fell asleep. I dreamt I became famous for a poem called Peace on Earth, etc. I dreamt my skin slipped open, it's kneading easy the inbreaking divine. Um, the next heartbreak poem uh, also takes a lot from Marilyn Monroe movies. I quote from a few of her um, films and the title itself is from the movie, The Misfits. You could blow up the whole world and end up feeling sorry for yourself. I've been obsessing over Marilyn Monroe and I think I might be in love with her, me and everyone else. I've been having stress dreams about my ex-lovers. They keep sitting next to me wearing too many hats. Sometimes we're in a church, sometimes we're in a park, sometimes we're in a bar. 
It's me, don't you remember? The tomato from upstairs. I am trying to memorize one good Marilyn monologue, but I just can't do the voice. Sometimes I fantasize about my ex-lovers dying. It is because they seem happy and I seem unhappy, but it's not that I want them to be dead so much as I want them to be sad and bald. After Marilyn died, Arthur Miller said he wouldn't go to her funeral because she won't be there. And that made me weep, walking down Portage, drinking McDonald's coffee. I don't have murder in me, probably. I'm learning to sit still with what is in me and forgive myself for it. How do you find your way back in the dark? Just yesterday, I shared a beer with one ex-lover while he told me he was sorry and also that he is trying to think of a reason for doing everything that he is doing, which I couldn't relate to. I'm trying to be less dramatic, but I also want everyone to pay attention to me as though I am having a crisis, which I am not. So you pull yourself together, you go on to the next job, the next saxophone player. The newest experiment of my life is that I'm trying to only wash my hair once a week, and the cycle of grease and self-denial has been extremely affirming. While I take my baths and do not wash my hair, I practice monologues for the two cats watching from the mat. A stairway to nowhere, I think that's just elegant. And I don't hate Arthur Miller at all, which I realize makes me part of the problem. I used to think I would be the sort of person who would attract love very easily, but I'm coming to grips with the fact that there aren't really reasons for very many things, though maybe, that's what I'm running away from when, sitting beside my ex, our knees touch, just once, under the table. I can tell you one thing, it's not going to happen to me again, ever. Uh, the, so the third theme, I would say, of my book um, is uh, this idea of, um, I guess, celebrating community and celebrating female friendships in particular, and the kind of remarkable, um, radical healing that is possible in those friendships. So I'm just gonna read uh, three more to kind of finish this reading, and they're all um, sort of centered around that idea. The first one's called Orbit. After the funeral, we took off our shirts and sat backyard in our bras, thought to water the tomatoes, but instead drank Rattlers, diagnosed each other astrologically, fell asleep with red shoulders, shocked the world could still reach us, shocked our skin still held sun. And this is communion. We turn to ritual, dyeing each other's hair in the bathrooms of the houses we house it. We stain the counters, paint bruising the laminate. We do not make everything into a metaphor, try knitting. Accumulating mildew and fruit flies, we drink from mason jars left under a full snow moon, push bare hands into gray slush and wash the car with it. A coyote running along the river stops to stare. How embarrassing, our howls, our tilting to sky. We splash the pinups by the bathtub, collages we clipped from old playboys and replace them, cut careful halos around their heads. We perform at parties and nail the lifts. Often, we open our eyes at night to see someone kneeling by the nightstand or curled in the closet. They are crouched and confessing. They are denying. They are grinning with small, sharp teeth. Upon waking, we conjure probiotics, brew and ferment. We search the carpet for claws the cat has shed, place them points up under our pillows. We find a little dead bird on the windowsill, bury it in the tomato plant. We sit around on the kitchen floor, a box of red wine and the mugs our mothers made. We tell each other some of what has happened to us. Something has happened to all of us, our telling teaching us this. It helps to say it happened, to do this in remembrance. It helps to say this body, this blood to say, me too, me too. Um, and then I'm gonna close the reading with the last poem of the collection called Grainy to Froth, Red to Burst. 
I cried on the phone to Wendy as I walked down Wolseley, 18 gardening hippie dads averting their eyes. One of those first hot spring days with worms noodling the sidewalk, bird crescendos lifting the petaled planet green and wet from winter's womb and me wanting to die. Wendy remembered the time we took the bus to Seattle in February, stood in the wind at the pier, our necks twisted up to see all that gray ocean heaving itself into concrete, collapsing grainy to froth. The curdled earth, she cooed, returns with an onslaught of rot. I was staring at a particular tulip bathing above the mulch in sweetest 10 a.m. sun, beaming red to burst. Gasped into the phone, unzipped my fleece. Wendy, I said, ducking my head, flower blurred between blinks. I'm going to eat up. Brushed my nose against small seeds, rouged my cheek, kissed then tore pollen tender between the rubber of gums, giggling pigment. Yes, that's what I'll do. I'll eat this whole world up. Thank you again, Revolta. I wish that I could see you all in person. Um, and yeah, thank you for inviting me to read today. All right, well, thank you, Sarah, for those really, really lovely poems. I'm sure everyone is clapping in the chat. <laughs> um, okay, well, that was great. Um, let's move to our second reader then, um, Francine Cunningham. Uh, Francine Cunningham is an award-winning Indigenous writer, artist, and educator. Um, a graduate of the UBC Creative Writing MFA program, Cunningham's work was shortlisted for the 2018 Edna Stabler Personal Essay, won the 2019 Indigenous Voices Award for Unpublished Prose, and won the 2018 Short Grain Writing Contest. Um, On Me is her first book, I'm really hoping I said that right, <laughs> and has been shortlisted for the inaugural BC and Yukon Book Award, Jim Davis Prize for Writing That Provokes, and the 2020 Indigenous Voices Award in Poetry. You can find more ab out about her at www.francinecunningham.ca. So welcome, Francine. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, this is officially my very first reading in Saskatchewan. <laughs> I mean, I know I'm not in Saskatchewan, but still, it seems pretty, it's pretty cool. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be reading from my book on me. And um, yeah, it's a book of poems, came out with Caitlin Press. And uh, I'm just gonna read a few poems from here and then I actually have another piece to read. Um, so, okay. So all the poems in this book are on something. So they're sort of grouped into different themes. So like on mental illness, on grief, on identity, um, on purpose, tradition, everything's on something. So this poem is on mental illness, fault lines. I've never known what my faults were, only that they existed, decided long before I was born. The faults lay in lines, carved into skin, the unseen codes, the masks of who I am. Under the surface, unseen, until they rip and groan to two halves in a violent thrust, making waves as tall as tsunamis, cracking ground, uprooting trees, creating new vistas. In the memory of my cells, trauma, passed down from generation to generation to generation. Residential schools, Indian sanatoriums, sexual abuse, mental illness, alcoholism, addiction. Each of these lay heavy across who I am, some more recent than others. All surfacing, creating upheaval, twisting through the landscape of who I am, who I might one day be. Waiting for the earthquake is sometimes worse than the earthquake itself. The anticipation of destruction, of needing to rebuild, of knowing what work lies ahead, but understanding that for every good day, there'll be many more bad ones. Knowing that these fault lines were formed in the womb, that I had no choice over them, is comforting sometimes. Other times the rage and fear consume me because what can I do? You can't patch the mantle. You can only prepare for the rupture, for what happens after. Learn to stand in doorways, to avoid falling wires. 
All right. So that was that one. Uh, and then I'm going to read one uh, on grief. Cracking eggshells, fertilizer for sunflowers, a simple act that undoes me, leaves me fractured on the kitchen floor, aching. When we packed up your things, invaded your closet, those secret places you kept for yourself, we found bags, multiple, filled with white and brown speckled shells, each fractured, fragmented, for use in the spring. Your garden, it bloomed this summer, with no help from your shells, kept over winter in the back of my closet. Um, yeah, so those are two poems from the book. And then I'm going to read, uh, it's like a poetic essay. <laughs> uh, and it's called Half Breed. All right. The smell of burning sage and sweet grass lingers on my skin. My hands fold in prayer and I send the smoke up to my God, to the creator. I send it to my mom, my aunties, my uncles, my grandfather, my great, great grandparents. I send the smoke that calms my spirit to their place of spirit. I thank them. They are the blood, the memories, the story that moves through me. My words capture the stories of our history. I give them away. That is my role, my job, although I don't always understand it. The smoke clears space for, my, for them, all of them. The smoke gives us a line to each other, the smoke. It lingers on my skin, folds itself into my hair, tucks itself into my clothing, reminding me to stop, to pray, to make, pay, to make space for them the stories. They made me forget my Cree. My granny speaks to me as we sit around her table with a plate of bannock, my fresh jam, and some tea harvested in the summer between us. There is a lot of laughter when you're speaking in Cree. One person says a few words, another joins in a few words, and then, I don't know, we're all laughing. They call you the crazy people because you're making all kinds of racket. You get most of the Cree back, although I don't know. Maybe I lost more than I know. I don't know about that sometimes. She is looking down at her hands, rubbing them over each other on the places where they're knobbed. Her fingers used to be able to sew moccasins into the early hours of the morning hold a needle between two fingers and string beads. Her hands used to be struck for speaking sounds that were deemed inferior. The Indian agent, he came and took us, told my mother she now had a job. He took my brother and me to a store, bought us new clothes. I got a dress and shoes. And then the next day we left Saddle Lake. They took away my new dress when I got to the school. I only got to wear it that one day. They gave me shoes that didn't fit. White Buffalo. That's what my family joked about over big dinners in my grandparents' trailer. Back when we used to gather for meals. Cousins, aunties, uncles. We all spilled out of the small kitchen and into the living room and the deck and the lawn, plates of food stacked on TV dinner trays, laughing. My cousins and I would line up to get our photograph taken and they would laugh. White buffalo, because of how white my skin was compared to everyone else's. We were always hungry. All of us were always hungry. There was no good food at the school, not like what I was used to back in Saddle Lake. My grandmother and mother's cooking was altogether different than this school. Some of us girls, we would line up to set the table and the oldest girl who was setting out the dishes, she would bring the bread and be pouring the milk into cups. She would look around to see if the matron was there. And as soon as we were alone, 
the older girl would run to the double doors and close them. She would grab some bread from her pockets and throw it up into the air, and we would all try and catch the bread. Some of us would be on the floor looking for the bread that fell. We were just like little dogs looking for this bread, trying to make a go of our hungry stomachs. She would open the door then and run away so we wouldn't get her in trouble. When I think of what my granny would make us when we went to stay with her, I think of the towering heaps of bannock, of jars of fresh pickled with their tops popped. I think of frozen berries thawed and put in a saucer of cream. I think of stew. I think of individual mini cereal boxes in front of rustling on the TV. I think of fish and chips wrapped in newspaper, of KFC buckets. I think of my granny always making sure we had enough pushing food into our hands for the drive home. When I got to the school, they covered my head in coal oil, the oil that they light the lamps with. There was no electricity then. They combed my head and there were all these little white worms in it. My cousin had to wash my hair after, but soap wasn't that plentiful. We had to do that every time they brought a new girl. I guess that's why most of us have problems with their scalps. The word struck me in my face. Prairie savage. They were meant to hurt me, and they did. The violence against me, violence against our women, violence against our men. Generations of this violence striking us in the face. I never got to speak to my brother the whole length of the time we were at the school. The only time I seen him was when we were walking into the dining room. The boys would be on one side, the girls on the other. I never got to see my mother the whole time I was there. She was working there in the Reverend's house, but they wouldn't let us speak. There was always someone watching. When you looked up, there was always someone looking at you, but not my mother not my brother. I grew up in the city. I spent months of time on reserves. My mother and father didn't enjoy camping, so I never got to learn to be in the bush. I lived with my grandparents for a time in Little Buffalo. I remember berry picking. I remember selling bannock and beadwork at powwows, but I remember the city more. I heard Cree spoken between my grandparents as I laid in the dark on sleepovers. I know my mother's dark skin. I know my father's white skin, her brown eyes, his blue eyes. I didn't learn much at the school. I never got more than grade five. I don't know what we were supposed to be learning. You are one of the good ones this phrase, this compliment that I'm supposed to be grateful for is one stranger speak to me often. And when I look them in the eye and ask them what they mean, they stammer back, well, you aren't a drunk. You have a master's degree. You're working. You're a good one. A lot of boys ran away from the school. They got to work outside on the farm and they ran away most times in the winter. And they froze on the road because they had no warm clothes. We lost many. There are a lot of graves on those roads. You're not really native. My friend said to me, you're only Cree and Métis. I stood up then. I am Cree and I am Métis. Cree for my mom, Métis for my dad, and I am what I am. Sometimes I feel like people want me to wear my status card around my neck to offer proof of who I am. But what does a status card prove? It's just a hard piece of plastic with my picture and numbers and on it. And my, I am my experience. I am my grandparents' memories. I am my parents' stories. I had an infected ear from being beaten at the school. My cousin who was there, Nellie, she would clean my ear because it smelled so bad. None of the matrons, the women who looked after us, would maintain it. 
If you got taught, if you got caught talking career, you got hit your head more than anything else. That's where I get my loss of hearing from. When I first learned about blood quantum, about the charts and the amount of blood you need to be considered native, I was disgusted. I am disgusted. Am I a half breed or am I my stories in my memory? My brother and I, we didn't understand English when the Indian agent came. My grandpa and grandma didn't understand English. It was only my mother who did because of her time at the residential school who understood when the Indian agent came and told her she had to come work there and that we had to come too. It was only the next day when he came back driving up in his big car that it sunk in, I guess, to my grandparents and they started crying. And then we were all crying because we had to leave them there and they didn't want to let us go. So smoke, it lingers on my skin. My prayers, they linger in the breeze. Our stories, those linger in my mind. And now, yours. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Francine. Everyone's clapping again. <laughs> <laughs> it's so it's so strange not being able to, to hear it, but it's all in the chat. <laughs> uh, very lovely. Um, OK, so thank you so much for that. And thank you, Sarah. Um, is there any questions that anybody wants to ask our readers tonight? Just throw those over in the Q&A channel, if so. <laughs> now we stand here and wait to see. <laughs> <laughs> We're all in a learning curve here, guys. <laughs> OK, I'll leave it open for here. What is the chat saying here? Mm, like 30 more seconds, and if not, we might just close out. <laughs> no? Okay. All right. It doesn't look like anyone has questions. Uh, Sarah and Francine, did you want to share anything else with us today? Um, am I still unmuted? Uh, no, you guys. Uh, well, I, if anyone wants to get a signed copy of my book, um, I'm selling them through my Etsy page. Um, so it's just demarcationlines.etsy.com. So um, I'm doing that because sadly we don't get to tour and I don't get to like sign people's books in person. And this is the best thing I could come up with. <laughs> I think, I believe we've got links to both of our readers' books somewhere in the chat. I saw that Taya did that. Um, all of you that are here probably did see our social media posts and um, I believe I put both of their links in those too. So if you do end up wanting them and then you're like, oh no, my goodness, how am I going to get it? Um, see our Facebook page, <laughs> Twitter, or Instagram. It should be in all of those. Um, but because we don't have any questions, I think we're just gonna close out our readings for tonight. So I am going to say thank you again to Sarah Enns and Francine Cunningham for coming tonight and sharing their lovely work. Uh, the University of Saskatchewan Department of English also. And as always, thank you to everyone who joined to listen. Uh, our next River Volta is going to be October 21st. So keep an eye on our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages for news on upcoming events. Otherwise, have a great night, everyone. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. This is so fun. Thank you, guys. It was great. <laughs>